Okay, hello again. So I wanted to have a separate presentation uh, for specifically for Mary Rowlandson and the context surrounding her captivity narrative, which is one of your readings. Uh, so this is about a little bit more about Mary and also the what was going on, you know, that led to her capture, also known as King Philip's War. Uh, before you imagine, you know, some British monarch as as being King Philip. King Philip was actually uh, Metacomet, who was the tribal leader of the Pequots. No, sorry, the Narragansetts, uh, who actually brought lots of different tribes together to fight the basically British colonial encroachment. And so the British referred to, colonists referred to him as King Philip in a sort of derogatory way. It was like a a nickname that they gave him, um, not his actual name. So. Just wanted you to be aware of that. So we've got a little quote here describing the war with the Pequots. This cruel war was attended by inexpressible calamities, each party making every possible effort for the total overthrow of its antagonist. So contact zones happening. All right, King Philip's War. Uh, the cause leading up to this war is as time went on, Euro-American settlers continually encroached on the native lands, pushing further and further. Um, to the margins and there was also at that time a lot of intercolony and intertribal conflicts happening so the colonies who were involved with this particular conflict were the, the Plymouth group the Massachusetts Bay group and the Rhode Island group so uh, remember that there were some folks who were uh, ousted from the Plymouth group uh, for you know dissenting when you know, Roger Williams being one of them, he actually went on to found uh, Providence, Rhode Island. So there's some, a little bit of bad blood between some of the different colonies uh, over various schisms that led to separation and starting new colonies. Uh, also competition for resources, things like that. The tribes who were involved in this war were the Wampanoags, the Narragansetts, and the Mohegans. Okay. I'm stuck. Dang it. Sorry about that, I, I got stuck, I had to unstuck myself. So this is a map showing what is now New England and showing the different states and the different tribes and how they kind of overlay with those states. So we've got the the Narragansetts over here in the Rhode Island territory. We've got the Wampanoags and the Nipmucks uh, uh, for Massachusetts and the Pequots over here in this region. So not a, not a huge, area, but a lot of different groups uh, sort of with different issues at play. So just to give you a sense of the, the geography of how much space this went across. So more about the war. Basically, there was a series of retributive acts back and forth, uh, which led to a an attack by Native groups on Swansea, Massachusetts in 1675 under the leadership of Metacomet. So it was kind of one of those, all right, you steal from us, then we steal more from you. You uh, took, you know, you burned down this, we're going to burn down even more. And it just got worse and worse until it led to a, a, a pretty massive attack. And then war was officially declared in September of that year. So it only took a few months to, to get it to that point. Uh, but the war itself, it of course built up quite a bit over time, but the the war itself only took a few months to be declared. And then the war itself lasted almost three years. It spread throughout New England and it caused considerable damage on both sides of the war. Uh, it took, it was a, a massive loss of life and resources on both sides. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay, so in the end, the colonies obviously won out. They, they had more resources, they had more manpower in the end, and so were able to finally uh, quash the rebellion. It took decades, though, for those colonists to recover from those loss of lives and the resources and property that were destroyed throughout the course of the war. And it was decimating to the native population for those groups who participated. And, and they never bounced back. Um, many of those who remained alive were taken as slaves by the colonists and any political independence that those groups had and negotiating power, anything like that, recognition of them as politically independent groups had officially ended at that point. They were now under the full and total subjugation of the colonists. 
All right, so where does Mary White Rowlandson fit into all of this? So a little background on her. She was actually born in England in Somerset in 1637. She came over with her family to Salem, Massachusetts, and then they moved to Lancaster. That's where she was taken. Uh, she married at the age of 19 to the Reverend Joseph Rowlandson, so he was a pretty prominent figure in the community as, as a reverend. Uh, she had four children with him and lost two. Uh, and then you'll sadly read about the loss of one of those children in the narrative. So her capture. She was in Lancaster when a group of Narragansett Indians attacked the town. Her husband was not there. He was on his way to Boston to raise aid for their defense because word had gotten around that there was going to be an attack, so he rushed off to try to go get some some backup, some help in the town of Boston, and so he was gone when they made their attack. Uh, she and three of her surviving children were taken captive, one of which did not make it. Um, many of her relatives and neighbors were killed or taken captive that night. Uh, her captivity, they basically took her and, and, her, and her children, um, though she was only able to stay with one of them, um, that lasted that in then moving around with them as they're kind of at war with the colonists that lasted for 11 weeks. So the narrative describes uh, what happened over the course of those weeks and the different, uh, what she calls removes. So that would be different camps that they make over the course of those 11 weeks and what happened at each one. So let's talk about the book itself, the, the history of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson. So captivity narratives were huge at the time, and this one was a bestseller all throughout the colonies. It was very popular um, because for a few reasons, it reinforced the sort of stereotypes about the natives that the colonists had come to hold so dear, and also uh, there was kind of a religious, definitely a religious bent to the, the literature as well. So that justified the reading of it, because remember, reading for just pleasure uh, for the Puritans is suspicious, suspect. Um, but this is, more, this is moral instruction. But at the same time, it's titillating. It's salacious kind of stuff, because we've got a woman in peril, and it's a very exciting kind of, oh, she's been captured by these savages, and we don't know what's going to happen to her. And, you know, you got it's a page turner to find out. So this was, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty hot stuff. Uh, there were several editions published. That's how popular it was. There's what different adjustments were made. And um, she, Mary herself, made a few adjustments over, over time, clarifications, things like that. It was highly unusual for a woman to have her writing published during this time. So we've got Anne Bradstreet's poetry. That was a, an anomaly, but this was highly unusual. And so you'll want to make sure to pay attention to that preface at the start of the, the narrative written by not Mary, but uh, a male relative basically saying, you know, she didn't want to publish this. This was not her idea. She's so modest and she's embarrassed and she doesn't think anybody would want to read her pathetic little attempts at, a journal. This is just for her personal kind of edification. And but we just loved it so much, we twisted her arm, and she gave in. And so now we all have the, the benefit of reading about her experience and uh, the way it's made her faith stronger. So that kind of thing. But yeah, otherwise it would have been considered immodest and highly suspect for her to have published her work. And it started a whole trend of captivity narratives. This was not the only one. But this is certainly the kind of the quintessential one for the time and really kicked off a tradition of those for people. They couldn't get enough. And one thing I just wanted to show you real quick that I think is pretty interesting and very telling. Um, it was po it was really popular over in Europe, too. The British just ate it up. They thought it was fantastic because it's like, oh, we've got these wild colonies and these savages. And, oh, there's this, you know, colonist over there and here's her experience. And they really, really liked it. But they had a different edition than the American one. And I think the title, the difference in the titles, um, which are both very long, which tells you about how they 
how they treated titles at that time, but the American one has some differences than the English one. So the American one is the sovereignty and goodness of God, together with the faithfulness of his promises displayed, being a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, commended by her to all the desire to know the Lord's doings to and dealings with her, especially to her dear children and relations. So that is a little bit different than the other one. A true history of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, a minister's wife in New England, wherein is set forth the cruel and inhumane usage she underwent amongst the heathens for eleven weeks' time, and her deliverance from them, written by her own hand for her private use, and now made public at the earnest desire of some friends for the benefit of the afflicted. So there's just something much more, um, I think, salacious about the English version. I mean, they're both long and kind of stuffy, but the English title leads off with Mary versus the American one, which is leads off with the sovereignty and goodness of God. And it takes it about, till about halfway through to even get to Mary's name. Um, so it's very focused on the Lord's doings to her more so than the English title, which is, it does, it, I mean, I don't see, I don't even see any mention of God in that one. So uh, the, the Puritans would have had a different kind of focus, I guess. And we can see that with the different titles. Okay, so if we were in a face-to-face -face class, one of the things that I would have y'all look for is examples of the natives in the narrative, Mary Rollinson's narrative, being described as or standing in as instruments of God. So she does this frequently throughout the narrative, and it's important that you kind of go through and as you're reading and notice the times where when, when the natives are maybe sympathetic or kind to her or give her anything that she n never <laughs> attributes it to their kindness or generosity, but always to b basically they're just vessels for God's mercy toward her, uh, which I think is pretty telling. But notice too, over the course of the narrative, her, the way she describes the natives and it really does undergo some pretty drastic and significant changes as it would living with anybody for 11 weeks, but so just keep an eye out for that. Um, another thing that I would have y'all look for is examples of how women, gender roles, are described in the narrative, particularly in the way that Puritan women and Native women are similar and different. So Mary spends some time talking about the women, the Native women who she's living among, and it's not terribly complimentary, uh, of course, but it's just interesting how she sees herself in relation to them, how she sees their their relationship to their children, relationship to her relationship to her children, um, and then, you know, how she talks about them versus how she might talk about the men in the group. So, uh, pretty interesting. Keep a Keep an eye out for that, too. I mean, there's definitely some times where Mary is a very sympathetic character and she undergoes just unimaginable difficulty and trauma over the course of her captivity. But there's also times, too, where it's a little harder to be sympathetic um, with her because, well, you'll see for yourself, I hope. But there's three sides to every story, right? There's what he said, there's what she said, and then there's the truth. So, okay, that's that. Thank you.